I'm just back from the local home store and I got a sheet of plywood in the back. And I've got an idea about my shop vac. I think there's a, a better way to do it. So I'm gonna unload that plywood and let's take a look. Maybe we can build something that's fun. Welcome to Roby's Garage Workshop. Featuring the craftsmanship of Roby Price. Well, here it is. I've got a shop vac attached to a cyclone. The cyclone is on top of a bucket within a bucket. And what I have done is I have bolted a piece of plywood spacer to the bottom bucket and then attached that to the shop vac with a bungee cord. Well, the bungee cord isn't quite strong enough and every time I pull on the hose from the cyclone to try to move it around the garage, it falls over. So I think putting this in a cart is probably the best approach. Also in this cart, I want to have some hose management, electrical cord management, and I want to have one of those attachments that will allow me to start this after I've turned on my sander. Let's see what we can do. All right, I've got this thing apart and I'll start taking some dimensions, but I wanted to show you, this is the wheels to the Cyclone. Not real expensive. The shop vac isn't any better. At least this one has bearings. So we will not be going back with these, and I only have three of these, so that doesn't work anyway, and I'm not gonna bother to take this out of the plastic. I don't know about your garage, but I've got spare parts everywhere, and I've got four of these caster wheels. A little oil, They'll work just fine. In addition, once I put the box around this, it'll have more weight. So that's part of the problem with this, is it never really had any weight to keep it stable. So we'll use these. I've got about 16 inches across the top, and I will want the box to fully enclose this section. As a matter of fact, I want to go all the way up to the top of the uh, suction for the cyclone, because like most people, I pull my shop vac around by its hose. But on the back side, I want to be a little bit lower. I'm going to come down and just come in underneath this section right here because these ears right here, they stick out too far and I don't need a box that big to contain this. So I've got some measurements. We're going to go over to our plywood. We're going to mark it out and we'll start doing some rough cutting and we'll clean up that cutting on the table saw. Well, typically I'd have the garage doors up, but I can't generate enough light to overcome what's coming this way and I'd be a brown mess if the garage door was up. So we'll just leave it with the door down right now. So my plywood sheets are roughed out over there. The sides of the box are 16 inches. So what I'll do is I'll take the plywood, put it on the straight edge, and give myself a good cut at 16 and a half. Flip it around, and then give myself the, the money cut at 16. And from there, we'll, uh, we'll have two good straight edges to come come by and those will define the dimensions of our box. Now there's some other cuts that we're going to make, for instance the top of the box that aren't really going to affect too much. We're going to get close and it's going to look good, but at the same time they don't require as much effort. On plywood, when you can, use the factory edge to help manage your first cuts. On the table saw, if it's square, it'll stay square. But if it's, uh, if it's not square on the plywood where you did your rough cut, you are going to have problems. So the first thing to do is to cut the 16 inch sides and front out and we'll get that started right now.
For the sides, we're going to do the same thing. They're 30 inches tall at the very front, shorter at the back. It doesn't really matter that much. But I'm going to make the first cut at 31 and 30 and one half, then clean up the other side using the same technique. All right, I have both sides parallel and they line up great. By touch, these things are perfect. However, on these sides, not so much. I cut that with skill saw and I had no guide and I don't have a track with my skill saw because <laughs> I gotta work for a living. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm setting up a square. This is a sheetrock square. If you don't have one, get one. They're cheap and they'll save your life. And I've taken this piece of scrap and I've cut it, I've ripped it on the fence. So I know both sides are parallel. I'll bring this up, I'll square this up with this fence, and then I'll use some two inch screws to secure both this, this, and the one underneath it together. And then I'll rip all the whole lot on the fence. Once I get a straight edge over here, I'm good. It's over because now this edge and that edge will be square. I just have to flip it over and cut the other side. So take a screw and these screws, two inches, will not go through both sides. And this right here is scrap. Now that I've done that, I just want to check it one more time. Everything is good. And we're flush up there. All right. Take the opportunity to put the next one in. All right. Now, I'm going to double check the measurements because this is not where I'm cutting. I'll be cutting over here on this side, so I've got to double check. Give me a moment and we'll make the cut. Well, the large pieces are cut. They're square, they're great. The smaller pieces I prefer to do on my cross cutting sled. But we'll do the same thing. It's actually easier this time because I can make this cut right here at will. The fence is already set at 30 inches, which is what I want. So I'm gonna go ahead and make these cuts now and let's go. You'll note that I pushed the piece against the fence in order to get an accurate measure. A little sloppily, I might add. You also note that I pushed the fence away in order for the piece to clear. This is so that the piece will not bind against the blade of the saw and the fence, thus avoiding kickback. Well, we took off our trim, and as it turns out, it fits up very square and very nice. The next thing to do is to take this down. I want to come in and hit that dimension right there, but I want to come up here to give this a little bit of support. In addition, right here, I've got a little bit of length right here, so cord storage or, or hanging and, and uh, hose hanging would be real good in this region. So I don't know, right now I'm toying with making something on the bandsaw, a nice arc right there. The trouble is duplicating it, but you know, it might be worth doing. Let me take a look. Well, I've gotten this straightened up and I've drawn myself a curve right here for the bandsaw and I've got another one over here for to make it a nice transition. Um, just a little show. But I've got a straight edge right here that I want to maintain and I'll cut that on the table saw as well as this one right here. The table saw is the most accurate tool I got. The bandsaw is a lot more freeform and doesn't produce nearly as clean an edge. There'll be a lot less cleanup later if I do this. I've secured these two pieces together with four pocket screws. 
they're one and a quarter so they don't go through. So what I'll do now is I'll take this to the table saw and make these two cuts. Being very careful not to go too far, the table saw cuts on an arc. So I will have to stop here and here. And I'll put those marks on there and then take it to the table saw to make my cuts. When making a cut in a piece of sheet stock, raise the blade as high as possible. That will give you the squarest possible cut. Additionally, mark the piece with a piece of tape so that you know where to stop. Finally, after the cut is complete, stop the saw. Let the blade come to a complete stop before pulling the work out. This will help reduce the chance of kickback. All right, I'm here at the bandsaw, getting ready to make a, a cut or two. Uh, situation is not ideal. This is a little tighter than I like it. So we're going to take this very slowly. And in truth, we may end up cleaning this up on the jigsaw. I'm gonna give it a shot, but I have my doubts. As a matter of fact, we are going to clean that one up with the jigsaw. Well, I didn't really have enough room on the bandsaw to get to this cut over here, so I'm gonna do it with my jigsaw. It really doesn't make that much difference. This was the good one, and, and it did come out pretty nice. That'll be minimal cleanup on the uh, on the belt sander. So I'll go ahead and make this real quick, and uh, and then we'll get out the drum sander. Well, this is one of the nicest tools I own, not because it's the best tool I own, but because it does exactly what it's supposed to do and didn't cost me hardly anything at all. I bought this used and it has worked like a champ. Also, let me point out, this is one of the primary tools that I used that little cyclone and shop vac for. So it's going to get a little dusty. Not my preference. I usually like to have uh, some suction on this end, but I don't have it right now. Fortunately, I don't have that much to uh, to trim up. So let's go ahead and get started. Where are my glasses? There they are. One thing you didn't see me do is to mark the areas that I'm sanding with a pencil. That corner that I'm currently sanding had a pretty good burn mark on it from the jigsaw. So fortunately, I knew where I had been because after the burn mark was gone, I was finished sanding. That's also a common technique used on the jointer and the planer to mark the face of the surfaces with a pencil, a marker, or sometimes even a crayon. Once the mark is gone, you're finished. All the pieces of the main box are pretty much cut. I want to install my wheels first, so I'm going to drill holes. I've got some 3 8 um, screws, some washers, some, some nuts. Again, from the, uh, from the uh, surplus bin, always keep extra hardware. Always buy more than you need and store it. When placing these and getting ready to drill the holes, we want to go ahead and make sure we've got some space here. Because if we push this too far to the corner, we're not going to be able to get our bolts in. As is, I've got to take these first three out before I can get to the last one if I ever have to do anything with this. But I, I think that's going to be okay. So what I'll do is I will put my spacers right here and then I'll snug this up, make some marks with the pencil, and then drill out my holes. All right, well I've got my holes drilled and I've got my wheels attached with a couple of clamps. Uh, looking at the distance, the clearance I've got, it is just barely there, but that's for my saw. This saw is elevated, it's a little higher. I, I wanted the, uh, the cutting surface to be higher than the fence to my jointer so I could get larger stock across. Think about my shop the way it's set up. It should make sense to you. Um, as a consequence, this particular setup is not going to work for a standard saw, and I would like to see it go underneath. So what we're going to do is we're going to gain a couple of inches by cutting a hole in the bottom and dropping the bucket down. What else you can do is you can use a smaller bucket and, and achieve the same thing. We're going to cut a hole in the bottom. That'll sink it down. We're also going to put another plate in here when we get this in place. We're going to put a plate in here with another hole in it that will support the bucket from the brim around the, uh, the top of the bucket. And that'll give it the real stability. 
So I'm going to get started with my circle cutting jig and we're going to make ourselves a few cuts. Three. All right, I brought the camera over here so that you can see. I want you to see what really the critical dimension is. You might think it's at the top up here in this region right here, the distance between these two. It's not. It's right on down here, and it's this wheel right here. For me, I've got these stops, these lock stops on the, uh, on the wheels, and that's what's causing me to have to move my bucket out. So those are going to define where the circle goes in the bottom of this bench. And uh, I just wanted to point that out to you. If you didn't have this stop right here, you would have yourself a little bit more distance and you could come closer up to the front here. But right now I don't. These wheels are free. I'm going to use them. But it just keeps in mind, you've got to make sure that it clears this right here. Because if you don't, you're going to be in a sorry state um, when you actually do put your bucket in place and find out that you've got to move the whole thing back that way as a result. Um, don't know how this is going to come out on video. Looks like it might be a little fuzzy, but I'm going to include it anyway. Um, so we're going to use this as a means to measure where our hole is. I'm going to go ahead and mark the hole lightly with a pencil and get ready to, uh, to put, a, put the circle jig in place. Well, I'm set up at the workbench. I've got a piece of scrap over here and my workpiece is screwed to it. Three screws in the back and that'll be underneath one of the plates so you'll never see the screw holes. It's a shop piece of furniture, but it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, I needed to do that because I need to level the clamp lower than the, uh, the end of the router jig. And, and this is a store-bought jig. What can I say? I, I got lucky for Christmas, so I might as well use it instead of make my own. Um, I've got the router set up at the right dimension, uh, centered on the cut, so my cut will be just a touch longer, which is fine. And um, I'll be watching this bit pretty closely because it's had a tendency to walk. I haven't figured out if it's the collet, if it's the router, or if it's the bit. So we'll be watching this pretty close. I'm not going to lose a piece here because I'm going straight through. So we'll go ahead and get started and give it our first cut. This is my first time with this jig. A couple of things of note here. A plunge router would have probably been a better tool for this job. My plunge router was otherwise set up and I did not want to tear it down for this. Secondly, there is a piece of plywood underneath this cut. I'm not going to have an event when I finish making the cut and uh, the circle falls away. Lastly, cord management could have been done a little bit better. This is my first time with this jig and I was not anticipating all the drama associated with the cords. Alright, it's a new day. We're getting started. I have taken the liberty of looking at how we're going to set this thing up. Um, I've got my bucket in. It's sitting on two pieces of plywood to give it the appropriate distance. It's in the hole that I cut. I knew that my hole was going to be a little bit larger. I may put a few cleats or stops in there. Don't know that I need them. This is what's going to really hold the bucket and keep it stabilized. And I always knew that that brim would be perfect. If you get this too close, it's either going to bind or it's not. You'll never get it perfect. So two pieces of plywood underneath raises it up. I've got eight inches right there. I will go ahead and take out of my scrap or extra plywood. I'm going to cut a plate right here. That'll give it the real support. And that'll be what supports the bucket. And I will screw this to my side plates, and that's fine. But I don't want the screws to support that action in shear. That, that's never a good situation. So we'll get that done first. Then we're going to start looking at this front plate and how it fits in together. I have an electrical box. It's got a good ear right here. We'll put a cleat on that side so it'll secure real tight. I have a spare plug. I have a lot of spare plugs, but this isn't the one we're going to use. Um, and this will allow us to plug in our device that turns the shop back on when our accessories turn on. So a lot to do this morning, but you know, at the end of the day, I think we're going to make it. All right, I'm here at the saw. I've got a, this is the scrap plywood that's left over. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut a 10 inch section out here, turn it over uh, on its side and then get my 8 inch out of that. This is a factory edge and this is a factory edge. So I'm going to be very close and this is going to be completely hidden. So I don't have to go back and get a perfectly, perfectly smooth edge on this. It'll work out just fine. So just two cuts here. Uh, I'm going to go turn on the dust collection. Well, I've positioned the plate and I've looked at how things lay out. And basically for my hose, it's this dimension right here, just on the other side of this knob, and I'll probably trim that back just a bit because I won't need this anymore. That's what I'm going for as far as actually trying to capture 
within my uh, homemade clamp um, the area. And it, you need to know the diameter of that circle in order to, uh, to capture it properly. And it's hard to do that with tape measure, but if you've done any turning, some of these, were, these are really handy items. And you can take these, give it a little bit of a turn. Boy, this one needs a little oil. And, and once it, it just starts to go through like that, just barely, then you know you've got your dimension. And from here, very easy to figure out exactly how big that hole is. And that's one and seven eighths. Now I've just got to find a bit that's one and seven eighths. Three. Well, I searched through my barrel bits and I actually do have one that, uh, that's pretty close. As a matter of fact, I have a set of them. And, um, and these things are very handy. And I would encourage you to get a set. Uh, they're not terribly expensive. Buy the whole set, don't buy them one at a time. It's more cost effective. So this has a brad point pit on the end of it. That'll help us center it up and I'll go ahead and drill my hole. And by the time I put the, the cut through the center, that'll give me a little bit of clamping pressure. And if I don't have enough, I'll be honest with you, I'll just take another shaving off the top of that clamp and eventually I'll get enough to make it work. So this is what I'm going to use and we'll go ahead and set up. We'll get set up at the, at, uh, at the table to cut this hole. This is a little difficult to see, but uh, we'll go through it anyway. You'll see I've got a mark at the very top and bottom of the diameter of the hole that I want to cut. Well, I took a dimension one inch from either side of it, and neither one of those dimensions was equal to the center, but they were close. And they were so close that you can eyeball it. As a matter of fact, if you can get the two marks within about a quarter of an inch, you will always be dead center just by using your eye. Now in addition what I did after I found the center I made a mark at the front end and the back end of my piece with my square because when I cut the line there's no nothing you can do it's always on the wrong side. So I have my center and I'm going to take my bit which is a brad point bit in the center of my barrel bit and I'm going to put it right in the middle and I'll drill my hole. Well, my hole turned out pretty good, and I've got a little too much stock there, so I'm going to trim it back to about one and a half inches off the edge. The, uh, but I need more than that around the hole. So, you know, sometimes a piece of tape, or a roll of tape in this case, uh, is perfect for getting the diameter just so. I have several to choose from. Now, I will make cuts at the table saw to get the straight edges straight, but I will make that arc at the bandsaw. And now we sand off the rough edges. I'm over here at the drill press and I've made my mark so I know where to drill. I've put my fence, set it up so that it will drill center on this and I like these little fences on the drill press. They do a really good job. Um, so yeah, we'll use this. We'll start this hole right here and then we'll finish it up on the, uh, on the main plate. Well, I've taken the time to actually change out my bit. I want to use a twist bit on the other side. I didn't like the way the feel of the brad point bit 
came through the wood. So what I'm going to do is go with this twist bit. It'll go through this first part much simpler, and I may get a better cut. I'm not exactly sure. When I look at the bit, too, I've also got enough room to get down to the bottom of this. So let's give this a try and see how it works. All in all, I think I like it better. I think the brad point was better to start out with, but as far as following the hole all the way down, uh, I am a little concerned with how this is going to come out. Hopefully, it didn't wander off too much or, or cut away at the sides of the hole that was there. This, brad, this twist bit did a much better job following the, uh, the existing pilot hole. Something to keep in mind. Well, this is the moment of truth. I have my holes marked and my bit installed in my drill bit. This is a twist bit, and it's got a relatively shallow attack. I'm going to countersink, or I'm going to put a spot in each one of these center points. This is just an old bit, old Phillips bit, but it'll dent the plywood enough to keep the bit centered on the hole where I want it. One of the reasons I like the Brad Point bits is they don't wander as much. The twist bits have a tendency to do so. So we'll find out real quick if, uh, if this worked out or not, and I promise you, if it didn't work out, you won't see it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, you'll see it. Well, one thing about woodworking is that you make mistakes, and I'm going to show you the ones that I make. And I've made one here. It's a little bit disappointing. I did not include the fact that Cyclone is not centered. The exhaust is off. It looks to me like about an inch and a half. So my hole here, although everything lines up perfectly, it's just a little too far this way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recut this piece. Fortunately, I have enough stock to do so. And fortunate for you, I've told you about this. You won't make the same mistake. And um, we'll go ahead and, uh, and back up. Um, probably not going to show you the full bit on, on that. This hole is going to be a little more difficult to do. I'll have to put a little extra lanyard up on there before I cut it. But I think we can recover pretty quickly. Everything is going to be the same, so I'm not going to show you this again, but, uh, yeah, 10,000 hours. I guess this is one of them. Well, okay, I've done a little pre-assembly. Nothing screwed in place. It's just sitting here, and I'm looking at how I'm going to put my box in place. And I want to place the box such that my unit here, my electrical switch unit, does not come past this plate right here. So I think what I'm going to do is take a piece of scrap, not this piece of scrap, and use that as a backer to push it far enough over. This gives me enough clearance. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this down. I'm going to get this probably vertically, maybe about here. I want to be clear of my, uh, my, my attachment hardware, my barrels there. Probably about there, I'll take myself a bigger piece of scrap and uh, I'll cut the hole in here with a, uh, a drill and a jigsaw. Well, this is one of the least critical things that we have to do today. Uh, drilling the hole for this is, uh, or, or getting the hole done for the electrical, it's not a big deal. But I do want it to look kind of nice. It's going to have a cover plate, the back side. It might as well be square. So I'm going to use the same technique I did by using a uh, Phillips bit putting a, uh, a, an indent there so my bit doesn't wander too much. I've already made the holes. It'll be pretty easy enough to do. That'll go a long way for helping me get the jigsaw hole a lot better.
Well, I have completed a number of items here that uh, I did not film. I was not as interested in showing you the electrical as I am the woodworking. But just to bring you up to speed, this is a 15 amp electrical outlet. I've put him in my box. I've punched the hole. I do not have a gland for this, but I do not think I'll need one. I will secure this to the carcass. And additionally, I'll tie a knot in this cord and put it inside the box. So even if there is some pulling, it won't pull on the, uh, on the terminals here. Uh, black goes to brass, white goes to the other side, and green goes to the ground. And you're usually out of trouble. There's any number of ways to test to make sure that this is hooked up correctly. I like to use these. They're bulletproof. You just plug him in. Now that he's plugged in, you plug this in. And I've done this before. I knew that there wouldn't be a spark or a fire. I also knew that there would be two yellow lights where they should be and no red light at all. So we have the correct hookup. I'm going to go ahead and pull this plug out, put a knot in it, and I think we're getting ready to start to do some real assembly. We'll do that assembly with pocket holes. I think that's probably the easiest way to go. Well, I'm back at the workbench and I've set myself up with my pocket hole jig. This is what we're going to use as the primary means for assembling the cart. And I've got my drill bit set up with the bit and it is as simple as just drilling a hole. All right, so over here, try not to get the cord. As you can see, I've got, this is what I'm going to use to hold my cord in place. This screw's not all the way in because this screw's going to actually go through the other plate as well. Make sure that we're lined up as good as is possible. All right. All right. We're using one and a quarters. I would recommend, and I will do this in the future, having a clamp to hold this down. Okay, there we go. I think I'll leave the camp clamps in place to give it a little bit more stability, although, be truthful, it's probably okay. But we'll put this back. Well, you can probably tell that I've achieved my ambition of getting this whole thing to go a little lower. We are much taller with my side plate than I had originally thought I would be. I think I'll make, I could make the cut here at the bottom where this piece comes off, but to be truthful, I think I like it better here at the top and it will not interfere with how this piece goes in. So I'm going to make a mark here, take it to the table saw, I'm going to trim it, I'm going to put my edge back on with the, uh, with the, the jigsaw and then I'm going to sand it smooth with the drum sander. A little extra rework, re -work, but it's going to be okay. While we're making some progress, I think you saw me put these pocket hole screws in place. Since then, I put ones across the bottom and ones across the top. And just so you can see, our piece here fits nicely and flush on top. What I want to show you in the back has to do with the cord management. I have a clip right here that actually will crimp the cord very tightly in place. The screw here is deep enough that it'll go through into this plate here, giving it even more stability. Also, these plates right here that hold the top of the bucket, those will screw into these as well and they'll just go screw straight through. There's no need to put pocket holes in those. So we're making a lot of progress and uh, I think the next time you see this, it's going to be almost assembled. Well, 
I didn't make a prototype. This is the first one, 001. And when I put my cyclone here and my shop back here, I noticed that it didn't quite fit right. My solution has been to trim my saw, and I did that on the table saw, no big deal. You've seen me use the table saw before. But this little bit right here gives me enough to clear, and that's what I wanted. In addition, my shop vac, I could have used smaller bolts, uh, but I don't think it matters. I'm going to put a piece of plywood here as a plate to raise the bottom of the shop vac a little bit higher than the top of these bolts. And I think that'll solve the remainder of my problems. I don't see too many other issues with all the fit up. I'm going to get after it and finish this project up. Well, here it is. I know I did some of the last things without you looking, but uh, I think you've seen a lot of this before, and I think I demonstrated most everything. This is the long way from where we started. If you'll recall, this was all I had holding these two units together. Um, a considerable change. I can pull this thing by the hose, which is one of the things I wanted. It fits underneath my table saw in between the legs, and that's great. It's shorter now. It'll fit under your saw as well. I've got some cord management to this side. You may recognize this. This is one of the holes we cut out to make room for the cyclone in the box. Lastly, I've got this electrical switch. So when I turn my sander on, the shop vac comes on too. And it's got a timer to turn it off. This is going to be a big addition to my shop. And I'm looking forward to using it. I think it'll work great in your garage workshop too. <laughs>